Thursday edition of Birds 65. Mac and Mac being joined by John Stolness from Bleeding Green Nation. Uh, always fun when we get JS up, and I knew we were due to have him up, and then I read his uh, column, but uh, rule changes in the National Football League. I said, I got a couple things I want to run by him. Um, but uh, more importantly, John, the rule changes, and rule changes will be big, is since we haven't had you on since free agency started, mm-hmm. what do you think is the most impactful move that Howie Roseman has made so far during this offseason when free agency mm-hmm. began? You know, I, I'd like to give you some kind of creative answer. It's like, oh, really? Oh, I didn't see that coming. It's Saquon Barkley. Uh, it, it really is. I mean, I, I think with the with the addition of him to the offense, they they clearly have tried to make this offense impenetrable that so that there's no uh, weak link on the team. They they on that side of the ball anyway. Um, obviously, Jason Kelsey leaving is going to be an issue, but I think that's why Saquon is important because. Uh, with some of the uncertainty in Cam Jurgens at center and who's going to play right guard, having a veteran running back who you can have on the field, both when you're looking to run the ball and throw the ball, and a guy who's decent in pass protection is going to be important for this team. And and having the running back by committee, uh, I think, generally speaking, has worked for the Eagles over the years, but that really is effective when you've got a stable offensive line. And there's just some question marks now about the interior of the offensive line. Uh, I like, you know, Bryce Huff. I think I'm excited to see if he can ascend kind of like Javon Hargrave did when the Eagles signed him. Can Bryce Huff be an every down edge rusher? Can he be on the field on, on, on running downs and, and helping the run game? That's still unclear, but he's certainly going to provide a lot uh, rushing the passer. And, you know, I think some of the other moves that they've made around the edges, CJ Gardner Johnson is certainly a, a, a big move. And so I could understand if you wanted to argue CJ Gardner Johnson in that spot, but Saquon Barkley is such a needle mover as an offensive player. If he's still got juice in the tank, I think he's going to be a, a, a difference maker for that offense. And this team is still going to win games primarily because of their offense. That's the way this team is built. That's the way it's drawn up. That's where all their superstars are. And I think that's where they realize let's keep the strength to strength. And so I think Saquon is going to be most impactful. Yeah. And the Eagles are telling you that John, they called him special uh, yeah. down at the owners meetings. We've heard the term weapon. We've heard the term presence. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, we'll see if it works out. One, one thing I found interesting and I haven't rolled out to you guys, so I'll do it now. And I was thinking about yesterday. I think we're all susceptible to nostalgia. If we go back to our youth and we like something and go, oh, wow, isn't that great? Um, Howie's gotten a little nostalgic uh, over this offseason. Love Saquon Barkley coming out. Love Paris Campbell coming out. Love Kenny Pickett coming out. Yeah. And he goes in the rearview mirror instead of looking at front. Now, in the case of Paris Campbell, who cares? If he doesn't work, he doesn't right. work. I think Kenny Pickett, you know, Cost effective backup, that's going to be fine. No issues. Hopefully, he doesn't have to play. But with Saquon, 2018 is a long time ago, John. Mm-hmm. And and if you look at all three, the theme of it, all three different levels, and, and but none of them lived up to the billing. Even Saquon, if you look at his career, not one all pro berth. He was supposed to be the guy. Mm-hmm. We can talk about the the supporting cast and that that's all legitimate, but he's never been the guy he was expected to be. It's how he too nostalgic this off season. Well, I, I agree with you. I think the nostalgia for some of the other guys you mentioned is, is no big deal. Nostalgic for role players is fine because you, you can, if they don't play well in, in the, in the summer, they don't play well in, in training camp and in games, they don't make the team. And I think that's a, a pretty easy thing to move on from with regard to Saquon Barkley. You know, I, I think you, I think you do have to look at the supporting cast he had in New York, specifically the offensive line. And, and I know it's more than just last year. But last year, it was a historically bad offensive line, and he had to try and make do with no with no running lanes. He had to try and, and, and make do with staying in to help protect more because they couldn't protect the quarterback. And he didn't have a quarterback last year. There was there. Everybody was was scheming up to top to stop Saquon Barkley. And that's been the case pretty much his entire career. Now, you could argue, hey, that was you know, that was kind of the case with Eric Dickerson back in the day. I mean, Jim Everett was a, a better quarterback than anything the Giants have had. But, you know, I, I think for most of Eric Dickerson's career, it was most he was the focal point of the offense. Uh, same thing for Barry Sanders in Detroit for a lot of years and those guys still ended up having hall of fame careers barkley's big issue has been injury right i mean i think if he if he's healthy in this offense and i still think with all the uncertainty on the offensive line 
it's going to be more effective than New York's offensive line was uh, over the last couple of years, then I think Saquon will have a big year. But th- there is a scenario where this blows up in their faces. And and I agree that I, it was surprising. And, and I think Howie Roseman does like to reach back into old evaluations of players and and see if they still apply, even even knowing that it didn't work out the first few years in the league. But I think with Saquon, there are some extenuating circumstances. Maybe I'm just telling myself that <laughs> to build this thing into being the uh, the outcome I want it to be. But, uh, you know, I, it, we'll see. I, I think if it falls on its face, I think that argument certainly holds weight. I hope John is wrong. I fear John is right because <laughs> I had an issue with one walk down memory lane that Harry Roseman took this offseason, and that's the Eagles' backup quarterback. And yeah. the hope is that, it becomes a complete non-issue because Jalen Hurts takes every snap this year. So it, it may end up being something that we talk about and then has no influence whatsoever on the Eagles season. I was okay with the Kenny Pickett acquisition. You get him for two years on the cheap. He was effective enough. He started in the game in the league. He has experience. He's nothing special, but you're talking about backup quarterback. Except on the same weekend, Justin Fields gets moved to replace Kenny Pickett in Pittsburgh, and he's the better player. Mm-hmm. And he costs less. The Steelers paid less than what the Eagles paid to get the guy he was going to replace. So, yeah, I got an issue with it. Do you put more emphasis on the talent of the player for the backup? Because the reason you got a backup is it's a safety net. What yeah. happens when Jalen Hurts breaks his leg week four? You're screwed unless you have a really good backup to step in. And I think Justin Fields is certainly more that than Kenny Pickett. So I had a big time issue with it after the fact. I was okay with him for 24 hours until I found out <laughs> Fields was replacing Pickett. Yeah. And then I go, wait, whoa, 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 Howie, why didn't you get, th- I didn't know the Fields was going to go. What yeah. is your thought on how the backup quarterback empty chair spun during that 24 hour period. Yeah. I didn't like the Kenny Pickett trade even before the Justin Fields stuff went down. I, I I feel, you know, it's great that they didn't give up much to get him. It's great that he's cost controlled, but if he's not a good quarterback, then you're giving something up for a guy who, if you're as as a Super Bowl contender is not going to help you in that way. And, And I understand you don't, there's not a lot of backup quarterbacks out there that can do what Nick Foles did for the Eagles on that Super Bowl run. There's a reason that was a unicorn situation. It's highly unlikely that if if you need a backup quarterback to replace Jalen Hurts for 10 or 12 weeks, that you're, you're going to get to the Super Bowl. It's just highly, highly and unlikely. And by the way, John, if Nick Bowles had to replace Carson Wentz for 10 or 12 weeks, the Eagles right. aren't getting to the Super Bowl. I, right. I, 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 yeah. I'm yeah, sorry, no, that's, people. <laughs> that's true. I mean, I think we saw what happened in, you know, I think for those of us who remember, what was it, 2002 when McNabb goes down and then Coy Detmer comes in and then Coy Detmer goes down and A.J. Feely comes in and you, you go, you maintain that. That's what you want out of your backup quarterback. And I'll, I'll just say Howie Roseman has said that the Eagles value the backup quarterback position probably more than most other teams simply because of what Nick Foles did. They understand the value. That was the whole point in drafting Jalen Hurts in the first place. So that's why I didn't really get the Kenny Pickett trade because I, there, I thought there were better options out there. I mean, I thought you could it, it, you could have gone out and just signed Andy Dalton to a one-year deal. He's worked with Kellen Moore in the past. He could. I would have more confidence in in Dalton being able to win three or four games for you if you needed it than, than Kenny Pickett. I just, I have concerns in Pickett the player. And with regard to Justin Fields, the whole reason they didn't trade for Justin Fields is because they were worried that if Jalen Hurts struggles, the calls for Justin Fields to start would grow insanely loud. Boy, and- I have I you know people say I rip bands. I I boy, really? They would I think really so. start calling for Justin Fields. I give I, well- them more credit than that. I think you know you've already started to hear some of the some of the talk about Jalen Hurts sour. You know all the the there's I think you know the 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 reports. Oh, maybe that have, you're right. I I I didn't even go down that road. I'm yeah. like wow. I, 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 yeah. Could because there's no Jody's right. There's no world in which on paper you you look at these two players and what was given up to get both players and you decide I want the Kenny Pickett deal. There's got to be something else that's weighing into the decision to go in the Kenny Pickett route. Uh, then let me let me give you John's opinion if you haven't caught us on Birds 365 here. John put a heavy emphasis on two years of inexpensive quarterback play. Justin Fields one year of inexpensive. 
I don't think that's enough to move the needle to say, yeah. all right, I'll take the lesser player. And there'll be less noise about replacing Jason. No, I need the best player. Give me the best player. And I believe Justin Fields is a better player than Kenny Pickett. That's why I would have gone that way if they were the Eagles. John, his his thought process and trying to match up with Harry Rosemore's two years as compared to one. Do you think that was the reason why the Eagles went there? See, I think John's right now. He might have been incorrect previously. It's a walk down memory lane. How he's mm-hmm. got this thing. Yeah. He went and watched him through the binoculars in that Thursday night game against <laughs> Carolina a couple of years ago. And he's never fallen out of love. Shame on him. And sometimes you got to move on. We saw Kenny Pickham for two years in the NFL. Eh, that's all he is. That's why I've got a problem with it. Well, yeah, but I would argue, what the hell is Justin Fields? I liked him coming out of the draft. Aren't we being this? Well, not me, because I've turned the corner. But Jody still loves him. Aren't you being a little nostalgic? Because I loved him coming out. He's stuck on ice. Now, there's a lot of... He finished uh, finished the season very strong, John. Boy, he's been brutal over the larger uh, spectrum. I think he's got trending up rather than trending down like Kenny Pickett. And you know I don't respect Chicago very much at all and and what they did to him. But they did it to him. I mean, I, I can't take that part out of the equation. I think too often, I say this all the time, John, too often fans think you draft a player and that's the player. And he's mm-hmm. either good or bad or indifferent or mediocre or whatever. No, you got to develop. You got to get them in the right scheme. You got to maximize what they do well. I think Chicago ruined the kid. I think they ruined him. So if I go back to nostalgia and said, yeah, he was pretty good coming out. And I thought he was pretty good coming out. <laughs> that's not the same guy right now. I, I'd be doing the same thing. I think Howie's doing. I, I Both of them haven't lived up to their hype. And Justin's hype was much greater than Kenny's. And arguably he's been worse than Kenny. Kenny's found a way to win games, better supporting cast. Again, there's a lot of context. There's always a lot of context. He's won games. He started 24 games. He's won 14 of them. That's a good game manager. That, to me, says good backup. You're not losing games. You're not winning games, but that's what I want from a backup quarterback. Don't lose the game. I have a good supporting cast here. Don't lose the game. I think that's what you want. I think for me, the kind of backup quarterback that I kind of had in mind was was – a guy who's been in the league a little bit longer, who has had experience as a backup quarterback longer. And, and I don't care about signing a backup quarterback to a multi-year deal. Uh, you can go year to year with backup quarterbacks. I, I don't think you need to well, have they somebody. Looked, they, you mentioned Andy they've Dalton. They looked yeah. at Andy Dalton. They wanted Andy Dalton last year before mm-hmm. they stuck with Marcus Mariota. Yeah, that's a different conversation because Andy's played a ton and won a bunch of games and made the playoffs. Um they wanted to go because of Jalen's contract. They and and it's gonna even though they set it up very well for themselves. They want to go a little bit cheaper. So mm-hmm. that understood. That's part of it. They don't want to pay seven, eight millions for a backup quarterback. So that's a different conversation to me. Sure. That might be wrong, but that's where they are. So if that's where you want to go, I'd like the picket move, even though I don't like the nostalgia part of it, which is a theme. It's I, not I guess- just about one guy. My, my thought is if you're going to give the job to Kenny Pickett, then why not just give it to Tanner McKee? I, I mean, because I know Pickett's had got some experience. He started some games. I just don't, th- I think that's more of a, I think that's more a reflection of Mike Tomlin and some of the other aspects of the team than, than Kenny Pickett. I think they win in spite of Kenny Pickett rather than him helping them to, to win football games. I mean, you just look at his, his touchdown totals over the last two years. He, he's a net, he's a net negative offensively for, for you. And so I, again, if Jalen Hurts gets hurt, it, it, it generally probably doesn't both. matter, but They're you know, screwed with both, that's the, you know, yeah. I, I just, just, just yeah. If you're trying to do it on the cheap, then, I guess Justin Fields is fine. I just, that's not the way the Eagles have always said that they wanted to do their backup quarterback, that they really valued that spot. And this just kind of seemed to belie that. All right. I saw your post about the rule changes in the NFL. Kickoff returns are back. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Exciting football. The only problem is I don't know how it's going to work. And I've watched XFL tape, but when you're watching something after the fact, Somebody's mm-hmm. putting a highlight package together to make a specific point. 
Sorry, yeah. I didn't watch that many XFL games when they were actually being played. But it sounds like a good idea, but I don't know. I want to say yeah. I know. This is either great or this is idiotic. I honestly have to tell you right now, I don't know. You did a pretty good job of describing it. You got a grasp on it. And you got an opinion on it. Yeah, I mean, I I like it. I think um, what it's designed to do is make it adva- make it advantageous for both the kicking team and the receiving team to try and return the football. Because there's a if if you kick the ball off um, and you kick it into the end zone for a touchback, the ball now gets placed at the thirty yard line. So that's not awesome field position but you generally speaking you don't want to you don't want to give the team a ball at the 30 yard line every possession so you don't want to bombing it out of the end zone most of the time probably is going to probably isn't going to be a, a great idea um it does take away the onside kick you the ball's got to get to i think it's the uh the 20 yard line in order to, so if it doesn't get to the 20 yard line it goes out of bounds before the 20 yard line teams get the ball at the 40 so what it's really doing is saying, okay, there's a penalty for the kicking team, not a real penalty, but you you get penalized if you don't get the ball inside the tw- between the 20 and, and the goal line because the ball is going to be placed too far out if for a touchback or an onside kick. So it encourages the kicking team to make it possible for the receiving team to field the ball. It's also advantageous for the receiving team at this point now because – you could you could catch the ball at the 15 and and fair catch it but what good's that going to do you so you're going to run it out if if the kicking team's going to place it inside that zone uh between the 20 yard line and and the goal line and because you have the players now you have the the kicking team lining up at the 35 yard line uh, closest to the returner and you've got the re- the receiving team's line 5 yards apart they're like right next to each other so you don't have these two sides running at full speed to 30 yards, 40 yards down the field and crashing into each other to set up these returns. So the hope is that it reduces uh, it collisions, it reduces injuries, it reduces concussions, while still allowing the, the receiving team an opportunity to return the ball and get the ball to, say, like the, the 25 or the 30 or the 35 or break a run. We don't know if it's going to work. We don't know. In the XFL, I think it looks pretty interesting. I think it, it just it brings back a play that has disappeared from football. Yeah. Well, 83% why, percent of kickoffs yeah. resulted in touchbacks last year. It just became a waste of everyone's time. Just put the ball at the 25 yard line and let's go. Let's, let's stop. Until Jeffrey we, just, Lurie called it embarrassing. Rarely the yeah. Jeffrey, uh, the, the kickoff in the NFL. So I'm kind of torn on this, John, because I like it because it brings back a play that they essentially eliminated, as you mentioned. But you also, you did a very good job there, but I started thinking to myself, God damn, this league over legislates everything. <laughs> why Why can't we just stipulate as a society that this is a dangerous game? And if adults decide to play it, they have to understand it's a dangerous game and then play the game. Or for all the do-gooders out there and like to point out that I don't care about people's health and safety and this and that. If you cared about people's health and safety, I'm talking not to you guys, those people. You would advocate, guess what? Don't play football because you can't legislate safety in the game. It's a violent, violent game. So why can't we just, it's silly for me to ask this, have some common sense and say (laughs) adults can make their own damn decisions because the hip drop tackle, which we haven't talked about, but I'll throw that in there. Mm -hmm. Every player's against it. I can't say every, I saw Kyle Long said it was pretty good. He's the only one. Every other player said this is a joke. Uh, what, what, what are we doing here? The players are saying it's a joke. Yeah. Yeah, and- you can't you can't lead with the helmet. You can't hit with the head. You can't lead with your shoulder in a lot of cases. And now you can't. There are restrictions on how you can tackle around the waist. Um, like, I, I get, you know, <laughs> trying to avoid injury, I, I understand. But if the players union doesn't want this rule and it's a rule designed to protect the players then what are we doing here it's it just seems it seems silly and impossible to enforce like how are you gonna if you're a referee how are you gonna see this in real time in real game speed and nail it every time you know it's just it's I think the horse collar tackle is when, when they've outlawed that I think we can agree the horse collar tackle getting rid of the, rid of that was a was a good call because you you can see very easily when a player is being horse collared and and that's well they that's, still screw it up though There's and they do, they, do. That, they, they they grab the shoulder it looks like mm-hmm. uh, and they call it so yeah it is tough oh. on the officials as well 
Yeah. I mean, it's so hard to do. You're right, though. The horse collar is a lot easier than this is going to be. Right. Um, and hopefully it's much ado about nothing. And Jody mentioned, and he's probably right. They'll find a bunch of people after the pack, but they probably won't call it that much. And I hope that's the case, even though players, that's going to piss off players more because they're going to get docked 20. And then you know how the NFL fine system works starts mm. at 14, 15, then it goes to 30. Then, you know, guys are getting going to get by the end of the season, 70 grand, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. cost of a Kia for uh, our <laughs> yeah. boy, Darius Lake, who stepped out and specifically said, wow, watch for the missed tackles next year because mm -hmm. players are going to go, I don't want to do the hip drop and get uh, dinged 20 grand. That is something legit we have to keep our eye on. And for your bleeding heart fans that you were talking about that there, John, real simple. If the players signed off on, we will not sue for injuries after our career are over and done with, the NFL would go back to play in 1980s football tomorrow. It's all about it it's all I, about lawsuits. I know. Well, it is. But That's it. Um, but I, I, I said that for many years, and it is. It's about legal indemnification. But they were always worried about uh, concussions and, and with cognitive issues, which are, are – and I was, I would always say nobody cared when Joe Polacco drug around his torn ACL. They were like, oh, what a tough guy. Nobody cared. He couldn't move, by the, which made him more susceptible to take a hit in the head. Nobody cared. Nobody cares about torn ACLs, torn Achilles. But now they're going to that and saying, yeah. oh, we have to take out because Mark Andrews got hurt. And and now it's, it's become... And then there's the unintended consequences. I keep bringing up Kirby Joseph, the safety from Detroit, over a three-week period, injured two big-time tight ends with the same hit mm -hmm. because he was going low. Why? Because he can't go up top. And those yeah. guys planted, and he went low, and he dove out their knees, and all of a sudden he's a dirty player, and he's like, well, what the hell am I supposed to do? Yeah. Yeah, players, and and the other thing too is like when you have to be thinking on the field, like as as a guy's coming at you, you know, and you're you're trying to make an open field tackle, you, instead of just your sole focus getting this guy to the ground to prevent a touchdown, now you got to think how you're going to get this guy to the ground. Well, if I attack him on this angle, I might go out of his knees, so I got to come up a little bit higher. But if he ducks down, then my shoulder's going right into his face mask, and that's going to be 15 yards too. So that's like Darius Slay. That's going to result in missed tackles. You're going to have guys thinking too much out there instead of just. Bringing, a, bringing the ball carrier down, which is what the game used to be about. I mean, and I get it. You don't want, I, I don't know if the game, I don't play. <laughs> I don't know if the game is more violent now than it than it used to be. You know, if the players are, you know, say players are bigger and faster and stronger than, than they've ever been. And, and that may be true. You don't want to see a DeMar Hamlin situation on the field, but that was on a, a perfectly legal hit and it was kind yeah. of a, a, a freaky thing. So Freak. even if you're making all these rules up, these guys are so big and strong and fast that even a legal hit could result in somebody almost dying on the field. So I, I get what the NFL is trying to do, but at a certain point, you, you it just goes too far and you have to say, is this worth it? Like, what are we doing here? Uh, John, I want to evoke the name of your podcast, Eye on the Enemy, mm -hmm. and talk about a couple of teams in the division that the Eagles play with. Yeah. Dallas Cowboys. We sit here and nitpick about the Eagles all the time. That's our yeah. job. Uh, the Dallas Cowboys are much worse off than the Eagles are this offseason. They've done diddly squat because Dak's going to count $60 million against the Caps. Some ungodly number this year. And Jerry came out this week. We love Dak. We love Dak. We love yeah. Dak. Well, we're not going to extend that. Okay, funny way to show your love, uh, Jerry. And they have done nothing in my mind, if anything. They've gone backwards pretty badly. And the New York Giants are thinking about drafting the next Daniel Jones at number six this year in J.J. McCarthy. That, that works. Yeah, let's replace the guy that we made a mistake taking number six at with another guy that five years from now we go, oh, yeah, we need to move out from this mm -hmm. guy. So if we may uh, pick on the Eagles a little bit and not agree with every single move, who it, have, have the commanders done enough to say, yeah, they're the only team in the division that's actually improved during this offseason so far? Yeah, I mean, I think the Giants also made some some decent moves, but I, the loss, you know, losing Xavier McKinney is a is is a big loss for 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 that defense and Barkley and, and Barkley, of course. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, so Barkley. I think it's it's a net negative for them, and it's certainly a net negative for Dallas. The Dallas fans are apoplectic. They they they're going they're beside themselves because they you they're trying to 
just kind of sit on things for for another year and this was a this was an off season where you either you either double down on Dak as your guy right and say okay we got to give him the extension and let's bring so let's let's try and strengthen this team around Dak this is the Dak Prescott Dallas Cowboys and and that's what it's going to be or you move on now you say okay let's let's see what the market has for for Dak Prescott maybe we can get a one maybe we can get a um maybe we can get some other players and 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 some some really good draft picks and let's let's reset let's refocus this thing let's get into a better salary cap position and and go from there and they've just it, it almost looks like they just like nah this is fine you know that they've just resigned themselves to whatever it is that they are right now and that's mm-hmm. a good regular season football team but a team that yeah. just has this has this issue in the playoffs and and maybe they are looking at their postseason failures and saying to themselves, you know, listen, we're going to take the, the, the 16, the 17 games and use that. That's the, 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 the longer stretch of information there, the, the longer track record. That's the, that's where we really know how good we are. And these playoff losses are just aberrations, but at at a certain point, if you believe that, then great extend Dak, right? I mean, do, do that part of it. It doesn't. What the Dallas Cowboys are doing makes no logical sense. But you have a you have a, an owner and a general manager and Jerry Jones who just doesn't seem engaged at this point. Which is, it's just bizarre. It doesn't make any sense. And if you're a Cowboys fan, you're losing your mind because you know you have an opportunity to to stay one of the NFC's elite teams or to set yourself up to take a step back for a year and then reload. For, for 2026, which is what the Eagles did a few years ago, taking a step back, reloading, and and look at where they are now, getting back to a Super Bowl, still a Super Bowl contender despite the uh, the disappointing season last year. So, yeah, I mean, I think if you're looking at teams who've improved themselves, it's the Commanders. I think have have done more than the Giants and the Cowboys have done. Oh, yeah. I don't love Dan Quinn as the head coach. I thought that was they missed out on all the guys that they really wanted, which tells you something about the Commanders organization, but. I, I think what they do at number two at quarterback is going to give the team a jolt. They certainly had all that cap space to add these different players. And, you know, they're in a great position <clears> to, <throat> to bounce back and maybe not be a playoff team in 2024. But we've seen stranger things. If you get a number, you know, the number two overall quarterback and and you have um, um who's the Texans kid? The name just popped right out of my head. CJ Stroud. Thank you, CJ Stroud. Yeah. You get a CJ Stroud like season from your number two overall pick. Well, you know, now you're talking. So yeah. it's, I have a hard time getting there in my brain because, you know, I live in the DC area. <laughs> I've seen a lot of Washington football here over these last few years, but there is a scenario where that is absolutely what happens here. Well, I, I would say Washington is, and, and you mentioned the organization. I don't, I don't know how you grade it, but I guarantee Washington has, has the most improved organization just from getting rid of Daniel Snyder. Right. They're, yeah. they're improved to yeah. a, to a great degree. Um, with the Cowboys, they're so interesting because it's, it's like a study in human nature. I mean, Jerry Jones at one time was a shaker and a mover. It, mm-hmm. It's been 15 years. He's now one of the most conservative owners in the NFL. What are people going to figure that out and yeah. stop getting upset? He doesn't, he, he doesn't do, he doesn't make splashy free agent signings. He doesn't make splashy trades. He hasn't been that guy for years. He relies on Will McClay, who might be the best personnel guy in the business. And they draft good players. They have drafted good players. And that's why they stay good. Well, you're right. I mean, the most interesting part and and the biggest way I'll I'll criticize uh, Jerry Jones, and I'll do it partially for Jeffrey Lurie. He has a clear lame duck at head coach. And he not only did that's and that's never a good idea. I don't mm-hmm. care what anybody says. When the players realize the head coach may not be there next year, a lot of bad shit can happen. He brings in Mike Zimmer on a one-year deal to be the defensive coordinator. He's been a family friend for years. He's been a great defensive coordinator. He's there for what? Who gets a one-year contract? <laughs> Same well, thing. What yeah. are the defensive players? If things start going bad, all right, well, that crotchety old man's not going to be here next year. Who gives a bleep? And that's part of my criticism with Jeffrey Lurie. Everybody in the league knows Nick Sirianni's coaching for his job. Right. I, I never think that's a good idea. I never think that's a good idea. 
Yeah, that's that's when you said that about I was like, oh, boy, that's kind of exactly what the Eagles have going on. And I, yeah. I think and I think if you're if you're a fan who's pessimistic about this team this year, that's the reason why, because this is a situation that generally speaking doesn't end well when you've got a lame duck head coach and you bring in especially a couple of strong coordinators uh, where you could you could really have these players looking more towards the coordinators for their for their marching orders and for their leadership than than the head coach. Now, by all accounts, the team still believes in Nick Sirianni as a as a head coach. That's what the players tell you. But you know, we'll see it on the field, and and we saw it on the field at the end of the season last year. It certainly didn't seem like that. Um, so that's why I think the variance with the Eagles here in 2024 is so great. They could very easily get back to the Super Bowl this year. They could they have the talent to do it. They're making additions to improve the team everywhere. I'm excited to see what they do in the draft, the different guys that they might add to to, to help out and, and to get themselves uh, a longer window of contention. There's also a scenario where this team wins five or six games next year because of all the turmoil with Nick Sirianni and the uncertainty there and and everything else. So I, I think the latter is more likely, but anytime you've got a, a, a head coach who comes in and you have a quarterback who's on the last year of a, of a contract and there doesn't seem to be any kind of extensions in sight. You're basically telling these guys you're, you're playing for your, your position with us moving forward. That's generally speaking, not a good, not historically speaking. That's not a good way to go. It's not, you're not going to have a very good season that way, but we'll see. Johnny, last thing for me, and we're going to have a uh, draft guest on in hour number two. So I'm going to ask you, are you, 80% up to speed, 90% up to speed, your draft preview work. We still got a month to go. So if you yeah. go, Jody, I'm not even halfway through yet. So be it. Just tell me. But uh, I, I, we are always overly interested in the quarterback position, even though it has no real effect mm -hmm. on the Eagles. They've got, oh, shoot, they signed another quarterback yesterday. Uh, I think they signed PPO. So they've got now five quarterbacks on the roster. So mm -hmm. they're not going to be drafting a quarterback, surely not one in the first round. And that's what I want your opinion on. Uh, most of us know who the top quarterbacks are. We debate the uh, order of them. Um, if you want to go four deep, go four. If you want to go five deep, go five. Quarterback, your ranking, top of the draft. How do you have them? What kind of order? And what is the drop off between guys? Yeah, you know, I think it's um, I think Caleb Williams is certainly the guy that everybody looks at. And I've been kind of I saw a couple of things online, like you know, uh, you know, Trevor uh, uh, Trevor Lawrence was a the, the can't miss quarterback prospect, and and look how that's worked out. You know, Caleb Williams is going to be the same thing. Well, I I still think Trevor Lawrence has a has a pretty good shot at having a, a good career here in the NFL. And and the I think Caleb Williams will go first overall i think he'll be i think he'll be the pick um at, at the top there um i like i think there's I, I think washington probably goes with with drake may i i at, at second overall um you know i think that's you know you've got the top three guys you know uh jaden daniels from lsu is, a, is another guy and then after that i think there, there's kind of a, a drop off uh, after that, I mean, there might be, you know, there might be JJ McCarthy, AJ, might be a, AJ McCarthy. a, a first round yeah, pick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think after that, you know, it's there, you're looking at more like, you know, second day guys, you know, Michael Penix Jr. Um, I know he got a lot of, a lot of, uh, publicity, um, late in the season with some, with some of his play, but then, um, kind of did not have a great national championship game. Uh, Bo Nix, Michael Pratt, Spencer Rattler. These guys are all guys I think will get drafted and they'll get drafted relatively early. But, um, I think there are tiers below those, uh, those really the top three guys seem to be in a tier in and of themselves. And I think you can throw McCarthy in as a, as a first round pick. I'd be kind of surprised yeah. if any Anybody else gets in the first round at Sean Stolness. Make sure you follow John on X. I know what you've been preparing for. It got pushed back. Your Christmas got pushed back 24 hours. It's miserable here as usual. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> uh, opening day. Uh, so listen to John. Uh, obviously, his football stuff, leading Green Nation, uh, but the baseball stuff as well. The good fight uh, Phillies. I'll so I'll end with the Phillies. Contender again, obviously. Is that fair mm -hmm. to say? They're my World Series pick. And and the way, you know, I kind of feel weird picking the Phillies to win the World Series. It feels like a homer pick, but I'm not alone. There's many national writers, national experts calling the Phillies a World a World Series participant and a few few people calling the Phil picking the Phillies to, to win the World Series. The bottom line with the Phillies is this. They went to the World Series in 22. They came one win short last year of going back to the World Series for a second straight year. And by all, they should have, they should have, gone back to the world series back-to-back -back years so there's 
there's it's clear this team is talented enough to be a a World Series participant, and they have enough talent to win the World Series. So why would I pick someone else? You know, I mean, like this this team clearly is a World Series caliber team. This is the best team they've had since 2011. I think you can argue in some ways this team might be better than the 2011 team. It's a more complete team, I think. They're they're they've got uh, a better offense than that 2011 team. Now that starting rotation was quite a bit better than than this one, but this this team doesn't have a whole lot of holes. And the holes that they do have there seem to be some options either in the minors or coming later in the season at the trade deadline you could patch if you wanted to. And we've seen in Major League Baseball now, you don't need to be great for the whole six months in order to get to the World Series. You need to be good for like four months or even three months in order to get to the World Series and then hit the pedal, hit the gas at the right time. So I see no reason not to pick this Phillies team to get to the World Series and to win the World Series. They have they may not be as talented top to bottom as the Braves and the Dodgers and maybe the Orioles in the American League, but they in a short series, in a, in a series in October, they are every bit as good as any of those teams and have shown that they can beat those teams. Yeah, you just scared me there, Stoneless, because <laughs> I, I remember someone, maybe I know him intimately, maybe I look him in the mirror every morning saying on this show, why wouldn't I pick the Eagles to go to the Super Bowl? They <laughs> lost to the Chiefs by a field goal. Another. Why wouldn't I pick them to go back to the Super Bowl? Uh-oh, and then the six of the last seven games happened the way they happened. So yeah. I, 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 we're on the same page here, brother. I hope you're right. <laughs> I got them going to the World Series as well. By the way, who you got them playing? Who you think's coming out of the American League? I got them. I got a 2022 World Series rematch. I got the Astros uh, getting back there, and the Phillies this time getting over the hump over the Astros. I think they'll be playing that other American League West team. I think the Rangers are going back, and I've already mm. bet on Rangers Phillies World Series matchup. I got the Phillies beating the Rangers. I put a little saver on the Rangers beating the Phillies too, but we're not going to admit to that on the air. <laughs> um, but Johnny, Matt, uh, Johnny, we always appreciate when you come on board. When does the next Ion Enemy podcast drop? Uh, we'll probably do one next week. Uh, this week, uh, with uh, the holiday weekend, I'm doing some traveling, so won't get one out on Friday. But they normally pop on Friday afternoon, so I think we're looking at uh, next Friday for the next one. Thanks. Done deal, John Stolness yeah. from Bleeding Green Thanks, Nation John. and the Eye on the Enemy podcast here with us on Birds 365. All right, uh, Jody Mac coming back. Um, we do have a draft guest coming up next hour. We'll give you the details on that in just a couple. Eagle fans, how would you like to save some money? Those Eagles tickets might be a little expensive this year. They're always going up a little bit, but not outrageous. Jeffrey didn't, he didn't hijack you. I'm going to give you a chance to save some significant cash right now on your car insurance. How about 40% would you like to save? You can do so with one of Jacob Sports great partners. Here's what you need to do. Call one of the two managing general partners, either Jim or Fran, and tell them you're a friend of Jacob Sports and Birds 365. Hi, I'm Jim Muehlbronner, Managing Partner at DelVal Insurance Group. Give us a call. We're a local, knowledgeable agency, not an 800 number. Go Birds!